So hi, how you doing? My name is Christian Lander. Thank you very much for taking the time out to come by. I'm generally humbled by your audience. Truly, I truly am. The likes, the comments, the subscribes, and the conversations I'm having of late have been short. They're fantastic. I really appreciate them. Please keep them coming along with your suggestions and ideas of guests and stories that you find that have been uh, uh, piqued your interest. And go, hey, Christian, go and have a look at this. So today, we're going to explore the curious. And that's where we're going to be going this one. Today, we're going to explore the relationship between the Griffin... And the Sphinx. So let me take you on a bit of a trip in time. I was about eight years old, and my mum had purchased a book, one of those special edition kind of... Uh, order it through the post kind of thing. It was massive it was. It was this big, yay big. And it was called like a Mystic Places. It was my Reader's Digest. Uh, it was a really, really heavy set black book. It really kind of like, looks like it. It's like a treasure chest of knowledge in there. It had like silver pages, right? Really, really high quality. And I can remember when it was on my legs, it, I, my, it would, like, they would encompass them and they would completely disappear because of how big this book was. And it was kind of the first kind of look in I had at uh, the, the Mystic Places around the world. Um, so there was stuff in there like Stonehenge, um, Angkor Wat, um, the pyramids of course, the likes of Tia Tumacan, uh, Machu Picchu, the Bermuda Triangle, uh, Stonehenge, again those those kind of things around the world. It was the first kind of time I saw uh, the Sphinx, you know, outside of people mentioning it kind of thing. When you're eight years old you don't really tend to notice these kind of things. Um, but yeah, it was the first time I kind of read about the Sphinx, and I kind of became fascinated by that. And I think I've read as much as I could, you know, I was at the school library reading more and more about uh, Egyptian history and um, the mythos of around that. Um, you know, so I, I guess in my very, very young age, I was very versed in that area, and uh, it fascinated me utterly, and I really wanted to become an archaeologist and go into that as a field of career. So the first time I ever heard the word Griffin was because of this book. The first time I heard the Sphinx was because of this book, back, way back when. So a couple of years ago, I published a video here onto YouTube uh, based on a lecture and a presentation that I gave and uh, expanded on it quite a bit. And it was called Large Sunken Islands, Ancient Gods, Technology of the Gods, and Sacred Artifacts. And I explored the relationship in the ancient history that w did, our, did our ancient ancestors see things that they had no words, no language to describe, and as such, that has entered uh, mythology and has entered uh, oral history. And perhaps has been recorded and changed al along the way. But still carrying through their threads of truth what it is that they actually saw. And I kind of wonder um, if the Sphinx and the uh, the Griffin carry that same kind of relationship. So, I, I say, I wrote this paper out over the last week or so, so I'm going to flow through it, and, uh, and here we go, really. Let's just, uh... So, I wanted to explain how close they were, really. So, the characteristics of a Griffin uh, within the mythology that envelops around the beast, they have it has a very common portrayal. And that is that it's seen as being regal, it's seen as being kingly, it's seen as being divine, it's in touch with the gods, it is, uh, it is from the gods, the griffin is. And it's thought of as being very wise, very knowledgeable. Uh, it challenges people with riddles, which I find quite fascinating, into contests of wit. So, and it was also often seen as a trickster. And the reflection of attributes are also found with the Sphinx. The characteristic of which is that our regal griffin, which adores the uh, the heraldry of the flags of a number of countries and uh, kingdoms all around the world, um, the griffin has a chimera-like body, that is, it's made um, of lots of different attributes. That is, it's an amalgamation of a body of a lion with the head of a bird of prey, and usually it's depicted uh, usually as a falcon. And it has the ability of flight, it has large wings uh, that protrude off its back, and it, it's found in stories across from Western Europe, and it's found as far away as Persia, Egypt, and as far away as India. And that's quite a wide berth for sure, to find this strange, unusual, gold-skinned creature. You've certainly got around, right? So firstly, one does ask, does such a creature exist in the natural world? Did one exist in the natural world? And does that leave evidence to suggest that everyone ever did? Well... Adrienne Mayer puts forth an interesting hypothesis. She's of Stanford University, and she puts forth of a potential candidate for the Griffin's appearance, at least. Uh, several fossil findings have been found to, of a creature known as a Pentaceratops, which is a, a five-horned um, front dinosaur. It's a large dinosaur of the Cretaceous period. It is a, is a, is a herbivore. And uh, the evidence of a beach face of the large, it's four 
legs, body, and observation, not necessarily its wings, but it does have a large frill that does extend um, over its back. So does this go some way to describe what a griffin looks like? Well, it looks like a key contender, only because it adds substance to another thing, is that majority of where the, um, the skeletal remains have been found of pentaceratops have been usually located around uh, gold veins. So this adds some substance to the fact that usually the legends depict that the gold was always guarded by a griffin. So it can add some substance to that story. An essay paper on the history of the griffin, uh, published by Unit 7 Research by Pibwara um, Selekeji. And uh, he discusses some interesting points that I'm going to highlight and add my own too. That uh, griffins are quite literally the chariots of the gods. In that the Greek god Apollo, the god of the sun, or rather the sun disc, the griffin would carry around the sun god from the earth to the skies. Apollo represents wisdom, knowledge, and power, all characterised by the griffin. Which leads to the question of whether or not people did, did not speak to the griffin, but were instead talking to Apollo, on or inside of the griffin. Rounded by the notion that despite depictions of griffins across their wide berth of scope, they are never identified as ever being individual, ever being named, ever speaking about themselves. There is no significant griffin in any mythos at all. Apollo is mirrored as Mercury in the Roman god Pantheon. Cultures seem to be either interacting with the same entities, taking on different names or variants, or the stories were adopted in whole, which is quite an incredible feat when you think about it, to have everyone take on another culture en masse, as a societal whole, where I'm sure there will be challenges, because one has to assume they would already have a set of values, a set of their own culture and belief structure. His Egyptian origin places, him, places Apollo as the Egyptian god of the sun, Horus. So let's look at some of the complexity of the sun god Horus. There really is an incredible statue at the temple of Edfu in Egypt. It's strong, it's imposing, it's complete with the presence of the head of a bird of prey, a falcon, his most frequent depiction. Horus is also depicted and described in Gods of the Egyptians by E.A. Wallace Budges, research published in 1904 as a lion. Later, also in the book The Fetish to the God of Ancient Egypt, published in 1934, a reference states that he appears in the form of a hawk-headed lion. There's a specific inscription in the Edfu Temple that tells us that Horus of Edfu transforms himself into the lion. Symbolism in the natural narrative recording wonders if the characteristics of being a lion and a falcon, and descriptions that are not meant to be literally be taken that way, but are intrinsically linked to him, Horus. Now, Selim Hassan, who is one of the most noted excavation leads and researchers of the 20th century, in one of his many publications, uh, one from 1949, where we're going to quote from here, is The Sphinx, Its History in, the light, in Light of Recent Excavations. So the ancient Egyptians identified Horus with the great Sphinx of Giza. The Sphinx is called Hor M. Akhet, Horus, in the horizon, or a variant, which is Hor Akhti, with a subtle difference on emphasis in the phrasing, and it comes to English as Horus of the Horizon. Salim Hassan admits that we have not a single contemporary inscription to enlighten us on the exact age of the Sphinx. The Sphinx Horangti, with its body of a lion and an eroded face, much smaller than the body that accompanies, accompanies, accompanies the megalithic edifice, most likely uh, the face of the pharaoh king who sought to update the Sphinx or defacing it of the highest order, perhaps in his own image, or seeking to fix. Of course, leaders and rulers have done this the world over, changing things to suit them. So, working together to attempt to date the Sphinx, uh, in 2004, there was a historical architect, Dr. Jonathan Foy, who worked with geologist Colin Reader, and they found there was high levels of rain erosion around the Sphinx's enclosure, they also confirmed 90s geologist um, Robert Schock, and they concluded in the time that the Sphinx is also much older than it is currently believed after the investigation of the 1990s. Schock argued that the particular weathering found around the Sphinx and the surrounding ditch the, mount, the monument was carved from displays features that can only be caused by, the prolonged, um, by prolonged water erosion. Now, any reader on the subject will know that, of course, um, 
that hasn't been rained around Egypt for quite a long period of time. Also, the head and body, in his conclusions, are massively out of proportion. And he said the Sphinx, the reason for this, is the Sphinx had originally an entirely different head. Now, going back to the uh, the rain thing here, the Egypt's last time there was any significant amount of rainfall in Egypt was 4 millennia BC, 4,000 years of BC, and that's a conservative guess. Indeed, the Sphinx, in fact, has actually taken a significant amount of damage over the years, not just from water erosion. Uh, it's actually been struck, it's actually, it was actually struck by a physical lightning bolt, and it was delivered with tremendous force, and in, its impact had left a mark. And uh, that, in fact, there's so much of a mark, there's actually a four metre long trace of mortar repair that uh, stands out where this collision occurred on the tail of the Nimes headdress on the back. The, uh, the likely candidate for this is a meteorite. That's right, as the description of the event is recorded in Egyptian history as an object falling from the sky with thunderous noise and descending in fire. And we also know that it to be a physical, tangible object, in that the texts that accompany us say that the lightning bolt also survived the collision. And we know this um, because uh, in the inscriptions that are found with it, uh, Khufu, uh, the claimed king Khufu, uh, came to actually see the thunderbolt in question during his tour that's mentioned in the Ibid. The, um, and it indicates the object was not a mere lightning strike, but a physical one which is why it suits the meteorite to be the answer of what it was. The, simultaneously, this also demonstrates that the Sphinx existed in the time of Khufu, because, of course, he recorded it. The, uh, this is contrary to the, uh, the general Egyptian view, the Egyptologist view, sorry, that the Sphinx is the face of Kafir, because um, it's only enough because Kafir is the, uh, is the son of Khufu. So time doesn't quite work around that way. And in fact, uh, Kafir's entire appearance is actually based on that of a 10 centimeter sized um, seated image that appears to resemble the face of the one of the Sphinx due to its high cheekbones, uh, even though it doesn't, it lacks a beard and a completely different type of headdress. Um, but that is the entire reason why Kafir Khufu are allegedly to be the face of the Sphinx. But of course, if the inscriptions that come with it say that Khufu came to investigate the damage to the Sphinx and saw the physical lightning bolt. That would therefore be that the Sphinx is already there in the time of Khufu, Kafir's father. But, you know, go figure. Uh, this is why many Egyptologi Egyptologists, uh, archaeologists, historians, geologists and journalists have very differing views that under loggerheads with each other over many aspects of Egyptian history. And this part, of course, is no exception. So the grand face of the Sphinx, the Horanki, the... Um, the face is the eastern horizon almost perfectly, and in fact it's, it's actually lined almost perfectly due east. Um, and on the morning of the spring equinox, which is a time, at the time of recording this, is about a couple of weeks away in fact, uh, it rises uh, in the processional transition of between Pisces and Aquarius, which is where we are of course right now, it's the transition of the eon right now. And um, if we take the line the Sphinx has been symbolic, as in as above, as below, which is the, the general phrase for a lot of what is across Egypt and certainly the Middle East. And I, in all fairness, I say that, that that, that kind of phrasing is found um, symbolically around the world. So I really I shouldn't just say the Middle East, that is actually found the world over. The lion faces the horizon uh, in the processional cycle. And uh, if, if Leo um, and the lion were meant to be together, right, if they were meant to be together, facing each other, symbolically in some way. The um, the only time that would happen, if, if the Sphinx was facing due east, as it does today, um, for it to rise in the uh, the constellation of Leo, you'd have to roll back time quite some way. In fact, you had to roll it back, well, about 10,000 years BC, to around 10,500 BC. And uh, the theme of as above, as below, um, is actually also replicated across the entire Giza Plateau. There's a, there's a guy I've followed for quite some time, uh, Robert Duval, and his, he has gone, along with many others, to quite considerable lengths to prove um, a certain fact, that it is not just the Sphinx, but also the pyramids and the surrounding areas, um, that there is a kind of time lock that is happening there, uh, patterned to mirror this moment in history. That is, the moment when everything was astronomically aligned. So the moment when the Sphinx faced east at a time when Leo was rising at the spring equinox, 
in 10,500 BC is a time when all the other buildings and the, and the pyramids and all the other structures around that of the uh, of the plateau mirror um, the the sky, the, the stars at a certain point in history. That 10,500 BC, absolutely fascinating stuff, and I really urge you to go and take a look at those. And that's a time also when there's a lot of things happening across the world. In fact, the Earth was going through a vast uh, global change because the ice uh, in North America had literally just been radically melted very, very quickly. And uh, the belief of this, based on facts and evidence that has now come to light in more recent years, is that it's due to a number of comets striking the Earth. And uh, it's called the Younger Dryas period. And uh, a time when... This would be a time when, in fact, Egypt was very, very lush with vegetation. It was very uh, very green and very fertile. Very much the opposite of the sun-scarred desert that it is today. Now, so, keeping with those thoughts in mind, uh, landlocked time, um, Horus having... Uh, the face of a a bird and the body of a lion. Keep that in mind. I really want you to keep, just keep that in mind for a moment. and uh, But put it on the backbone. Think about it. So I want to take a look at a more contemporary time. That is uh, World War Two. Seventy years ago, it literally is a, a grain of sand in the, uh, in the time capsule of that is history. There were many islands in the Pacific, right, um, where the natives were somewhat primitive in their in their development, shall we say. The Melanesian, the Polynesian Islands, of which today make up the likes of Fiji, the Solomon Islands, uh, Papua New Guinea, and so forth. Um, as America sought to bolster its influence and spread, uh, it certainly its military presence across the Pacific in an attempt to thwart the Japanese. Many of the islands became airfields and refueling depots. Uh, most notably and most frequently quoted is the island of Tanner um, in the New Hebrides. The islanders there had never seen aircraft before. I've never seen white men before. And in fact, they objectified them as gods. Because these, these airplanes were dropping goods, they were dropping supplies, food, and cigarettes. Which was then shared uh, by the military personnel with, with the islanders. That they thought it was literally being the gods providing them food. And that's, that's how, they, uh, how they understood it. It literally became a cargo cult. And of which there's many across the, the Pacific. Um, as Second World War came to an end officially, uh, the military personnel were redeployed, they were sent back, they retired or whatever, and the um, the supply drops, they ceased. But the islanders continued to mimic what it was they had seen by the occupying you know, quote-unquote gods. Um, they carved out headsets from woods, they were doing elaborate marching dances to mirror the parades of what these, uh, what these soldiers did when they were there. They were um, running military drills based on this. Um, but most notably, they were building effigies of airplanes and aircraft, which they believe and still do today, because many of these, should we say, cargo cults still survive even now. The John Frum being probably the most uh, well recorded. So, so, some 60 years on, as I've said, these whole religions and whole belief structures have been born out of this, with the belief that if they build it, they will come again. So you can probably see what it is I'm trying to illustrate here, is that how cultures have been heavily influenced to make bold signs, calling for their gods to return. So was the Sphinx built on a grand scale to mimic the fantastical which they had seen, that they had interacted with, um, in their time? So where we travelled in this article really is uh, uh, one asks the question, uh, does the current face of um, the Hor-Em Akhet, the Sphinx, we know that it's not its original face. Adding the pieces together, and uh, is there a possibility that the one idea that perhaps has never come to fruition is, is it not the face, not a lion, but is it the face of that of a bird of prey, a falcon? Um, and that would make sense, wouldn't it? If it was the body of a lion, the head of a falcon, and that is kind of depicted as, as how Horus is, which is exactly how Apollo is. We know these two characters are related together. Was the building of the Sphinx in an attempt to mimic, to recreate what it was that the, uh, the Egyptian people were seeing at the time. So, if so, the Sphinx then is literally the figurative griffin in stone, which then allows this, this uh, connection to occur. It's even stronger. And that seems to be the train of thought. The Sphinx, the Haru... <laughs> Ho M. Hackett, is very much the griffin of legend. But if then, if so, if that's possible, did, uh, did Horus, did Apollo really take to the skies and something that looked what we consider today to be the Sphinx? I don't know. 
I'll leave this question with you. I'll leave you to think. The uh, the links and the source material is posted down below. Please feel free to go and have a look. If you like, if you uh, want to comment, please do. You know, and let's let's begin a, a discussion, a bit of a dialect, and let's, let's see where the uh, the mysteries take us. But for now, my name is Christian Lander. Thank you very much for taking the time to join me, and I will see you in the internet in the future very soon.